Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Ruiz Dar, who is <coughs> um, a, a heart failure and, and transplant cardiologist up at Harefield Hospital. Um, thanks very much for coming to speak to us today, Ruiz, um, about uh, the role of transplant and when we should use it in patients with cardiomyopathy. Thanks very much. Um, um, Thank you, Thank Brian. You, Thank you, Amanda. And of course, organisers organisers for what looks like a fantastic um, session of uh, educational um, talks. Um, can you see my talk, Brian? As am I in we presentation? Can. Perfect. Yeah. Right. I'll just get going. Um, so I've got no conflicts of interest uh, to uh, share. To declare, sorry. Um, so timing of transplantation. Um, I think that that's critical in, in the whole thing, and I, I think this slide probably uh, emphasises what I want to say at the end of all of this is if you refer somebody too early, uh, the patient takes unnecessary risk of an operation and are exposed to the long term complications of transplantation and immune suppression. I'll, I'll come to that later. Um, but too late a referral, then the risk of the actual transplant increases substantially. And in, in many cases, the patient becomes untransplantable because of pulmonary hypertension, for example. Uh, and often, if referred to late, patients won't have enough time to wait for a suitable donor and end up dying whilst waiting. So getting, getting that timing right is critical. And I think the other thing I wanted to emphasize, patients you're, you're referring for heart transplant uh, by definition have advanced heart failure. And this can be a broad phenotype from the very obvious patient in NRHA class 4, Intermax 1 and 2, where they're hospitalized on ICU with high lactates, rising lactates, oliguric, low cardiac index, high wedge pressure. And we all can recognize these patients quite easily. But I would argue that patient is being referred quite late, but often can be unavoidable. On the other hand, you've got patients often in clinic who look very well, are ambulatory, working often, tolerating their disease modifying drugs. But if you were to do their right heart catheter, they would uh, fulfill the definition of uh, advanced heart failure with a low index and high filling pressures. And somewhere in between, you often see patients who have uh, deranged kidney function, for example, are pulmonary hypertensive, maybe having episodes of VT as a sign that they're struggling a bit, have increasing hospital admissions, breathlessness, rising BMP, or unable to tolerate disease modifying drugs. I think it's important to bear in mind that any one of these patients could be referred for heart failure. And what I'd argue is that referring them too late is exactly what we want to avoid. And there are some scoring systems, um, the impact score and the LEAP score, which look at outcomes post uh, heart transplant and LVAD surgery, which essentially just say, which is quite obvious, uh, those with advanced renal failure, liver failure, multiple inotropes, ventilated, they do poorer and are less likely to benefit from the transplant or LVAD surgery. So any combination of these comorbidities substantially increases the operative risk and often those patients are declined for surgery and instead what happens is they they're often um, optimized using short-term mechanical support with a view of bridging to a durable LVAD or transplant and it's quite a, a hard process to undergo. So my uh, the preceding talks very elegantly talked about the, the substantial amounts of money uh, trials um, ingenuity that have gone into developing heart failure therapies over the preceding decades. Um, and Ipsana nicely talked about how one in five uh, uh, of dilated cardiomyopathy patients uh, may not be alive after five years of diagnosis. And, you know, when, when I uh, started to get into managing patients as a house officer, survival for patients with newly diagnosed heart failure was around 20% at five years. And then with these modern uh, device therapies and drug therapies, it's overall, including the ischemic patients, is around 50% at five years. So these patients uh, have a lot of drugs and easy novel therapies that, that can help them, but many of them will end up in trouble and will need referring. Um, so just wanted to tell you about why you should bear in mind uh, about advanced heart failure surgeries, transplant and LVADs, and what can they offer you? This is uh, internet survival benefit from the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant looking at uh, thousands of heart transplants that have been done since the 1950s and overall in the uh, in in the registry there, there are 
the median survival from the point of transplant is around 11 years um, and conditional survival. And by that we mean if you survive the first year of heart transplant, then you, your patients can expect to live for more than 14 years uh, with, with a uh, substantial improvement in their quality of life. And I'll give you some more information about that in, in the next few slides. This is Harefield data uh, in, in our centre and I've looked at over 2,300 heart transplants since 1980 that have been carried out at Harefield and the cumulative survival by decade has been going up. Uh, we've had a recent blip here just emphasising the fact that uh, our risk profile of the patients we've been taking has been substantially higher and again just to point out uh, taking on riskier recipients leads to poorer outcomes but our, the, our median survival currently is around 17 years which is better than the international average and seems to be on the whole improving year by year. In terms of the medical management the patients post transplant get we can see that the conditional survival that is if you survive the first year of transplant most of our patients can expect to live on average for more than uh, 20 years so this is the blue curve is in the decade 2000 to 2009 and uh, you know those patients haven't even quite reached there's still more than 50 percent alive uh, at, at the 19 year period so uh, survival benefit there's a huge to gain in terms of quality of life we have in Harefield roughly 500 living heart transplant uh, recipients we follow up in clinic uh, we recently surveyed these patients to, to ask them about their quality of life and how they feel 273 responded and you can see in terms of age range we've got a lot of people now reaching uh, what we'd say is in in their 70s and 80s uh, and, and many in their 60s and 70s so our, our cohort of patients getting older and older and many of them were not expecting to be alive when they were transplanted at this stage and um, there's a whole mix of people but generally more male than female and we asked them about how they felt after the uh, their transplant 92 percent uh, agreed that they had a um, substantially improved quality of life 65 said their ordinary physical activity co does not fatigue them they don't get short of breath 88 percent said they were symptomatic at rest before the transplant uh, uh, and however three percent so not everyone is happy three percent said they would not have had a heart, heart transplant knowing what they know now uh, 93 percent said they do regular forms of exercise each week and 65 percent do more than 120 minutes of regular exercise each week um, the, in terms of emotional and psychological uh, benefits as well you know 34 percent of the patients pre-transplant said they had quite poor emotional well-being uh, which has improved since then so in terms of survival and quality of life there's no doubt the transplant can radically change your quality of life and massively prolong your length of life but it isn't uh, all uh, roses and uh, and wonderful the immune suppressants can cause problems so they develop comorbidities over time so many of our patients by the time they get to the 10 year period post transplant approximately 23 percent will have significant renal problems and two percent will have uh, will will either be transplanted with a kidney transplant or 6% will be on dialysis. Um, many of the patients because of steroids and tacrolimus uh, end up being diabetic and uh, you know, a five year interval, a third of the patients can, uh, can have to live with, with diabetes and about, about approximately half the patients by 10 years will develop significant coronary disease often known in transplant terms of uh, graft vasculopathy. So, there's a lot to gain but there are sort of nuances post transplant that need to be dealt with which is what I, uh, I spend a lot of time in clinic uh, managing and dealing with. Um, what are the contraindications for transplant and you know when when uh, when is a patient referred too late? Well some of the key features are elevated pulmonary pressure so pulmonary artery systolic pressure above 60 a peripheral uh, a pulmonary vascular resistance more than five woods units in our center we will take people with higher pulmonary vascular resistance but as long as it's the pulmonary vascular resistance is reversed with inotropic agents and comes down below three woods units we will uh, potentially list them for transplant a transpulmonary gradient above 15 
a BMI, uh, Afsana mentioned that before with a patient that she uh, she had, a uh, BMI greater than 35. And to be honest with you, anything above BMI above 33, it becomes hard to find uh, a, a suitable donor uh, just because of the, the size uh, sizing of uh, donor and recipient and matching them. We've only transplanted two people above the age of 70 uh, in Harefield's uh, time. One survived and, and one didn't. So it's incredibly rare that we would we would transplant above the age of 70. And, and po probably I would say above 65, we would be really cautious in doing that because the outcomes are poorer. Um, but if you've got a, a robust looking patient, then we will certainly consider it. Di diabetes um, is a, a big issue. Um, the patients with a hemoglobin HbA1c above seven and a half percent, despite optimal optimal diabetes therapy, is a contraindication, and 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 an absolute contraindication is somebody with microvascular complications, so proliferative retinopathy or neuropathy uh, and nephropathy are are absolute contraindications. So we need to uh, get hold of these patients before that happens. Other contraindications are self-explanatory, so active infection, advanced kidney failure with EGFR less than 30, malignancy, which is not uh, in remission and not cured. Uh, a recent pulmonary embolus with infarction is a contraindication because uh, if put on bypass, the patients will bleed, so we need a good two-month period before we can take patients like that on. And somebody with severe symptomatic peripheral vascular disease, whilst they could have a heart transplant, is unlikely to benefit from it, and, and the risks will increase because a transplant will not uh, cure them of their peripheral vascular disease. So uh, we would see that as a relative contraindication. Again, severe cere cerebrovascular disease and other uh, uh, musculoskeletal issues that would uh, limit their rehab post-transplant can be an issue. Our patients need to comply with medical therapy for obvious reasons because if they don't take their immune suppressants um, and if their social circumstances aren't uh, supportive enough, then then their outcomes are uh, significantly impaired. Hence the reason substance abuse, uh, lack of compliance and a lack of social support uh, are, are are good grounds to not to go ahead with transplantation. But why do we need to worry about transplantation when we have ventric durable ventricular assist devices? Um, we, we, the, they can, these pumps can often fit in the palm of your hand and essentially are implanted by the surgeon into the left ventricular cavity. Uh, this inflow cannula into the durable LVAD um, is around two centimeters in diameter and it has a rotating impeller device inside, which is uh, electro uh, magnetically ele uh, elevated with to minimize friction and it rotates around several thousand revolutions per minute and effectively acts like a Dyson Hoover where it sucks blood from the left ventricle and pumps it out into a graft into the aorta and can provide around five, six liters of cardiac output per minute and helps solve the patient of their heart failure problems. And there have been several trials over uh, the last several decades um, which have compared these devices to optimal medical therapy and then uh, over time with successive generation and better devices we now know that a two-year survival compared to medical therapy with patients who have advanced heart failure is substantially better when two years survivals around 70 percent comparable to heart transplantation However, ventricular assist devices aren't without their problems. Uh, patients with these devices, because they're mechanical devices, end up with many complications, including infection, bleeding, stroke, pump thrombosis, which is a, a very serious problem, often aortic regurgitation, right-sided heart failure because their left uh, side is supported but not the right, and renal failure. And if you look at a, a event-free outcome over a three-year period, majority, 90 or percent of these patients will have had one of these events, including a stroke or death uh, during this time period. So as a result of that, the NH within the NHS, these devices are only used as a bridge to transplant. So I, that means patients have the LVAD, 
with the intention of then getting a heart transplant, but not destination therapy where the intention is to live out your life with the durable LVAD and not be transplanted in the future. But often what can happen is they develop some complications like a stroke, which makes them ineligible for transplantation. The idea being we try and transplant them once the LVAD has gone in um, as soon as we possibly can. Um, readmission rates, uh, patients again over a three year period, majority of these patients will have been readmitted quite early on and, and have problems with ongoing readmissions because of the complications that I, I told you about. Um, if you consider um, competing outcomes, uh, if you have a patient with a left ventricle assist device after a five year period, uh, around 40% of them will have passed away. Uh, around 30% will have been transplanted. 20% uh, will remain alive and 10% roughly will have had their device explanted because of a, a degree of recovery. So one of the big issues about who, who we decide should go for a ventricle assist device and who should have a transplant is depending on their waiting times. And often this cannot uh, be, you know, be missed by referring uh, referring teams. And so this is why I think it's important to be aware of it. And clearly I've shown you how outcomes are vastly better with a heart transplant than they are with a durable device. So it's important to try and catch people early enough so they can go on to have a transplant rather than an LVAD, but only use an LVAD if they really need it. But one of the reasons why patients might need an LVAD is because their waiting time is projected to be very long. If you can see here, somebody with blood group O, for example, who has had a stenotomy and has got uh, antibodies against other uh, potential donors, their chances of being transplanted at three months is around 8%. And if they're a patient that's declining and rapidly getting worse, then you know they're probably better off going forward for a ventricular assist device than a transplant. Hence the reason if you know their blood group, if you know their antibody status uh, uh, you, you can and their body mass index, you can kind of predict how long they're likely to wait and that might influence an earlier referral. In contrast, patients who are blood group A, B or AB who uh, have have not got antibodies against other potential recipients and whose BMI is less than 30, their chance of getting transplanted within a three month period is pretty high at 81%. And it's important to bear that in mind when referring if possible. So to get onto the uh, heart transplant list within the United Kingdom, you need to meet at least two of these uh, uh, list of criteria and I'll quickly run through them. Um, so persistent NYJ class three to four symptoms despite odd optimal medical therapy, including CRT devices, a cardiopulmonary exercise test with a peak oxygen uptake less than 14 or less than 50% of predicted for your age and size. Uh, often, even if you can't complete a CPEX test because of your cardiac status, um, that can uh, allow you to be listed. Patients with persistently elevated BMP levels or n terminal pro BMP levels, a low cardiac index on a right heart catheter, two or more hospital admissions in within the year, despite being on medic good medical therapy and, ad and adherence to good medical therapy and rising pulmonary pressures uh, in a patient who might, for example, be in NYHA class two, but if the PA pressures are rising, that does allow you to be listed. Worsening renal function, so cardiorenal syndrome, low sodium, uh, ventricular arrhythmias, which might be a sign that the heart is decompensating and no longer coping. Um, uh, so I would recommend a combination of a referral to the EP team, but also to have a discussion with a transplant team with a patient with a DCM, for example, who's after a long period of stability starting to go into VT should make you query what's happening. Is a cardiac output dropping? Is a heart decompensating rather than simply refer for an ablation? Uh, again, self-explanatory, worsening end organ function, so worsening liver function and right-sided heart failure uh, uh, should uh, uh, precipitate a, a referral, but any two of these can get you onto the routine heart transplant list. Um, one way of predicting and prognosticating uh, we often use is the Seattle heart failure model, which is freely available online. And you put in 
patient's parameters and it can give you a two year uh, likely survival and mortality. So anybody with a, a survival uh, of less than 90% at two years, if you are worried and not sure if you should refer, but anybody that scores um, two year survival less than 90% should be referred for advanced heart failure therapies. So I've just got a couple of cases um, to discuss with you of real life examples of people who were referred to us and, and what happened. And, and then I'll have finished my talk and be happy to take questions in the panel. Uh, we had a 63 year old female, BMI of 22, weight nearly 60 kilograms, lots of antibodies, 72% blood group A, and her probability of having a heart uh, transplant within three months was deemed as about 38%. And when she was referred to us, she had a background history of cardiac sarcoidosis uh, since 2012, severe LV dysfunction, functional, severe functional mitral regurgitation, and she'd had previous VT ablations uh, and, and ICD and was on immune suppressants for her sarcoidosis, which was deemed to be quiescent uh, and burnt out and had been on prednisolone and methotrexate. Uh, we did her right heart catheter uh, in, in a few months later in 2017. You notice that her pulmonary vascular resistance was very high at five. And even though she was given inotropes, her pulmonary pressures remained high despite a better, slightly better cardiac output. And even though we gave pulmonary vasodilators with sodium nitrous peroxide at a, a reasonable dose, her pulmonary vascular resistance remained above three. And as a result of this, she was uh, accepted for a durable ventricular assist device, uh, which he subsequently had and has been living with uh, since that time and has had, unfortunately, several complications uh, as uh, with the device after a two, three year period living with it. When we reflected on this case and looked back from the time she was diagnosed in 2012, her, I've kind of written a table with a timeline of the whole um, event to the point where she had a ventricular assist device. She had an effort tolerance of roughly 300 meters back in 2012, low ejection fraction and pulmonary artery pressure of 29. I was deemed to be an NYHA class three, and she was on the whole host of drugs, including ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, aldosterone antagonist at the time, and the BMP wasn't ele elevated and a Seattle heart failure two-year survival was around 90 odd percent. So you could argue she, she may well have been referred at that point if she was on optimal therapy. But back in 2013, she started to get runs of VT um, and her effort tolerance dropped down to 20 meters and a CPEX test showed a peak oxygen uptake of 14.1. And any of these where criteria could have got her onto the routine transplant list. Um, however, I think the team at the time continued to increase her frizomide. She got better, her effort tolerance improved, and it wasn't until uh, a few years later, uh, uh, a couple of years later, BMP continued to rise and she was referred for assessment. And we, we found their right heart cath, she was pulmonary hypertensive, and she ended up having a ventricular assist device. Um, so I guess reflecting on her case, you know, had she had been referred a few years earlier, she may well have been transplanted and could have seen the benefit of having the, the median survival of 14 to 20 years rather than uh, five years with a durable device and the possibility of having another operation such as a transplant. The next patient is somebody um, with uh, uh, a 23 year old lad who uh, several years ago was referred to as he was blood group O. He had a load of antibodies, so his probability of heart transplantation, uh, sorry, he had no antibodies, but was blood group O, but his probability of heart transplantation was deemed as around 50 odd percent. Um, he had a diagnosis of ARVC uh, with a, a, a mutation found. He'd originally diagnosed at the age of 16 following a cardiac arrest and had since then progressively worsened with heart failure symptoms and it developed um, uh, hypothyroidism secondary to amiodarone therapy and he'd had an ICD implanted because um, uh, and but hadn't received shocks. Um, no recent shocks, but had had multiple therapies and he'd had several previous ablations uh, during his uh, time uh, since diagnosis. And he was he was symptomatic. He was breathless and could barely manage six steps on a flight of stairs. His echo, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with, was uh, just put a, taking a still image of his four chamber view. He's got a very dilated right ventricle and you can appreciate somebody with 
this kind of right ventricle, if the, if you put a ve left ventricle assist device in, their right ventricle is not going to cope with it. So already we were aware that he's not somebody that's going to do well or does not have a durable mechanical option. He can only have a heart transplant or, or nothing or a heart lung transplant. These were his um, uh, medicines, freezamide, bisoprolol, aplonone and ramipril because he had some LV dysfunction. His blood tests were pretty good. Uh, normal end organ function, liver and, and kidneys, bilirubin was slightly elevated. BMP was normal. Um, his CPEX test, he managed 12, uh, six minutes of exercise and peak oxygen uptake was 12. So anything below 14 would put you, puts you in that advanced heart failure category. And a VE, VCO2 slope was, was very high, above 35. His right heart catheter confirmed that he was uh, kind of in a borderline low cardiac output state with normal pulmonary pressures and and based on his uh, Seattle heart failure score, uh, we deemed that his two year survival was around 94%. In essence, um, got a couple more slides, so I'm finished. I can see Brian's on, on, on view. Um, we routinely listed him. Uh, he didn't get transplanted, um, but a few year, a year or so later, he had runs of VT and his pulmonary pressures were rising. So we urgently listed him and transplanted him and he's now really well, completely fine, has his own business and looks really good. Uh, so key points, uh, people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in small LV cavity size, they do not have LVAD as an option. And those with ARVC with dilated RVs do not have LVAD as an option. So you've got to be extra careful when referring. Thank you. Super, thanks very much. That was a, a really great talk. Um, so thank you very much. <clears throat> so if